Question. Is it possible the fog is picking up magnetic rotation caused by the Earth's natural magnetic field? Answer. I was considering that the Earth's magnetic field was the cause of the fog output. So I purchased a zero Gauss chamber to test that possibility. The zero Gauss chamber test falsified any possibility of the Earth's magnetic field being the cause of the fog output. Zero Gauss chambers are made from high permeability, stress annealed mu metal, which provides a consistent low field test area. Standard zero Gauss chambers consist of three layers and are designed to attenuate external static DC fields and low frequency AC fields 1000 to 2500 times. This is the zero Gauss chamber in process of testing the fiber optic gyro. The test resulted in no change in the fog output. Question. But I thought the Helmholtz arrangement canceled out the fog output. How did one affect it and not the other? The magnetic field would have the same effect as an anti-Helmholtz configuration. Answer. I can zero the fog's measured rotation in all three axes with the Helmholtz coil, but it takes a Helmholtz field with a magnitude that is 16 times the strength of the Earth's natural magnetic field to do so. If it were a one-to-one -one ratio or close to it, I could consider your proposal, but it is not in the same ballpark. I did prove the causal field could be and probably is a unidirectional field because the unidirectional Helmholtz field can cancel out the fog output in all three axes. But the causal field is not magnetic. The average Helmholtz field strength to zero the fog was 843 microteslas. The strength of the Earth's magnetic field varies from 25 to 65 microteslas. Where I live, the Earth's magnetic field strength is 52.6 microteslas. So, the Helmholtz zeroing field was about 16 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field at my location. Also, if the fog could be beaten up by such a puny magnetic field as the Earth's natural field, it would be a lousy gyroscope. A Helmholtz coil is a device for producing a region of nearly uniform magnetic field, named after the German physicist Hermann von Helmholtz. It consists of two electromagnets on the same axis. Besides creating magnetic fields, Helmholtz coils are also used in scientific apparatus to cancel external magnetic fields, such as the Earth's magnetic field. Here is a diagram of a Helmholtz coil arrangement. The radius of the coils equals the distance between the two coils. Helmholtz coil magnetic field calculation. The magnetic field inside the coils in the center is given below. B is the magnetic field in Teslas. N is the number of turns in each coil. I is the coil current in amperes. R is the coil radius in meters. Here is my Helmholtz coil in process of being constructed. 
I'll add that the hoops used for the coil are from my brother's wheelchair. I had a brother with cerebral palsy who passed away, and Dad gave me his wheelchair wheels to use for this project. Here is the Helmholtz coil set up for testing, and I'll add that this is a list of the Helmholtz coil test results. I show the direction of the X and Y axes, the voltage across the Helmholtz coils, and the current through the coils, the field strength generated, the downward angle of the coils off of horizontal, and the beam direction. In most cases, the beam was directed south with two minor anomalies. Average Helmholtz field strength, 843 microteslas. Average field angle of inclination, 24.86 degrees. Next is a short statement from Bob Nodell of Globebusters. People, the ether exists, and it is the ether that the fiber optic gyro and ring laser gyros have detected, and we have proven that in a myriad of ways on Globebusters. Um, science knows it because if science didn't know it, they would not be <laughs> they would not be looking for ways to prove Earth rotation even today. They would have simply cited the Michelson Gale experiment and said, "That's it, the Earth's rotating." They didn't because the Michelson Morley experiment absolutely invalidated it, d dismissed the possibility of the Earth traveling around the Sun at sixty-seven thousand miles an hour, and on and on and on. I have talked about this on Globebuster ad nauseum because I have researched it ad nauseum. Question. What is the consensus here? Is the Earth moving or not? Answer. The Earth is not moving. Question. I agree, but a lot of moving Earthers are using this as proof, and I can't make sense of it. If the laser gyro is just like the interferometer used in the Michelson-Morley experiment, why does the gyro detect 15-degree motion, but the Michelson-Morley interferometer did not? Answer. It is the same Sagnac effect in both devices, but here is the key. The Michelson-Morley interferometer detects forward, straight line, velocity, and the fiber optic gyro detects angular rotational velocity. Let that sink in. Watch the Malcolm Bodum videos at the end of this video with this firmly in your mind. Two different Sagnac effect applications, one measuring linear velocity and the other measuring angular velocity but the same Sagnac effect physics in both devices. Question. Okay, let me see if I've got this straight. Moving Earthers claim the null result of the Michelson-Morley interferometer set up to only measure forward velocity proves the ether doesn't exist, and the 15-degree angular velocity detected by the fiber optic gyro proves the Earth is rotating? Answer. Right. They want to have it both ways. Their proposal is self-contradictory and self-falsifying. They are lying to people, but can only fool the misinformed. Here is a diagram of the Michelson-Morley interferometer. And here is a diagram of the Michelson-Gale interferometer. The Michelson-Morley interferometer is set up to detect and measure forward rectilinear straight line velocity. The Michelson-Gale interferometer is set up to measure angular rotational velocity. The same application as the fiber optic gyro.
I would like to point out three research papers. The links for these papers will be in the video description. The first one is, The Sagnac Effect Falsifies Special Relativity Theory. Here is two quotes from that paper. Transverse and rotational types of motion are completely equivalent dynamical systems. Both the rotational and transverse types of Sagnac effects contradict special relativity. If we accept the principle that theories are falsified by contradictory empirical evidence, then special relativity's second axiom must be abandoned, no matter how dramatic the consequences might be. The second paper, also linked in the video description, is Error in Michelson and Morley Experiment. Next, we'll hear from Bob Nodell of Globebusters elaborate on these two papers. One of the, the reasons that was invented for the Michelson-Morley experiment not showing any velocity around the Earth, which of course was the Lorentz contraction, right? Um, this was offered up as an explanation um, because science could not be saying that, wow, uh, we are at the center of the, the universe and we're not in motion. That simply was not an acceptable uh, paradigm for them to have. And Jaron, of course, has has done a video on this with all the quotes and, and all that good stuff. So um, what this takes us back to is, again, when we're talking about frames of reference, um, Einstein, after the the Lorentz contraction was proposed and, and was basically highly ridiculed by everybody as it should have been. Um, this was the, this is what uh, caused them to, it caused Einstein to basically come forward with the, the theory of relativity and special theory of relativity. So one paper that we have here that uh, I uh, came across this week, and this is actually fairly, fairly new physics essays, 2018. Um, and it talks about the Sagnac effect. And of course, many of you realize that we have talked about the Sagnac effect because it is at the basis of what the fiber optic gyro and ring laser gyro actually are, right? They are Sagnac interferometers. Simple as that. Okay. Now, I'm sure all of you know the from the movie Behind the Curve, where I am in there quoting that, you know, when we hooked up this fiber optic gyro and we detected this 15 degree per hour rotation, um, that um, I was saying, no, it is not the motion of the earth. Um, it is the motion of the ether. And I said at the time that the reason that we know that it is the motion of the ether and not the earth that's doing this um, goes back to, uh, well, first of all, the Michelson Gale experiment, which detected this rotating ether, just like what we detected with the uh, fiber optic gyro. But then you have the Sagnac effect. All right. Now, the Sagnac effect basically is saying that um, when you fire two light beams around in a circle and then you rotate that apparatus or the fiber optic gyro in this case, then on one side of the light beam going around the circle in one direction, it has less of a distance to travel because you have already facilitated part of that rotation. And conversely, uh, on the opposite side of the rotation, you have a little bit longer period, uh, a longer distance for that light to go. And so when it returns um, back to the home base, so to speak, and develops the interference pattern, there will be a phase shift, okay? So this is all fine and dandy, right? Um, now, when the Michelson-Gale experiment was run, then they had to do Aries failure because they honestly at that time didn't really know, well, which one is it? Is it the Earth moving or is it the stars moving? Well, we had... We had uh, Aries failure, which proved conclusively in a very simple optical experiment that it was indeed the sky that was uh, moving, right? So then we have the Michelson-Morley experiment, which was designed to work in a linear type of phase differential. In other words, what they were trying to do was, was detect 
the motion of the earth around the sun, which would be a far more linear type of path, even though it is ultimately curve linear, but for the quote unquote frame of reference that they were using it for, right? It was a, a, a linear path. Okay, so what's going on then is that when they use this exact same interferometry technology, exactly the same as what was going on with Sanyak in the Michelson-Morley experiment, they came back with a null result. Oh my goodness, it's not working um, in, a, in a linear fashion. Well, that of course is when Einstein came up with the theory of relativity and also they had the uh, Lorentz contraction, which we have just you know found out is complete nonsense. So uh, in this paper, they're talking about this and it says, uh, it is often claimed that the circular Sanyak effect does not contradict special rel relativity theory because it is considered an accelerated motion, while special relativity theory applies only to uniform, non-accelerated, or linear motion. Okay, It is further claimed that the Sanyak effect manifests in a circular motion should be treated in the framework of general relativity theory. Well, you can't because it is a circular motion, so you have no frames of reference. We counter these arguments by underscoring the fact that the dynamics of rectilinear and circular types of motion are completely equivalent, and that equivalence holds true for the both non-accelerated and accelerated motion. With, res with respect to the Sanyak effect, this equivalence means that a uniform constant, V, we support this conclusion by convincing experimental findings indicating an identical Sanyak effect to the one found in circular motion exists in rectilinear uniform motion. What does that mean? It means that they're simply doing a phase comparison exactly like the ring laser gyro and the fiber optic gyro is uh, using, right, to determine this highly precise instrument, the fiber optic gyro, to determine direction, pitch, yaw, roll, uh, axes. okay? So by doing this, except applying it in a linear fashion, um, we find that it works exactly the same way, right? And so the bottom line is, is that the Globers will want to embrace and accept the idea that the fiber optic gyro and the ring laser gyros are detecting uh, rotation, but they want to reject the fact that Michelson-Morley did not detect any linear motion. And in fact, what we're seeing here is proof that it works precisely the same way. So you cannot disregard the Michelson-Morley experiment and accept the Sanyak experiment because they are both working in precisely the same way and special relativity has no application here, period. Neither does Lorentz contraction. Of course, we've just seen why, because that whole, the whole assumption of Lorentz contraction is complete nonsense, right? None of it makes any sense. It's chock full of assumptions and, you know, uh, fabricated axioms that people must accept, right? We must accept it because it's a scientific theory, even though we have violated every tenet of what a scientific theory is. So this is why I say that it is because uh, of the, well, the reason that mainstream did not come out and claim that the Michelson-Gale experiment proved rotation of the earth, the reason they didn't do that, and they certainly could have, is because they knew full well the implications of what the Michelson-Morley experiment actually meant. And that's why they tried to focus in on the Michelson-Morley experiment and invalidate it by saying that, oh, well, yeah, the phase differential effect may work in the Sanyak effect in a circular motion, but it can't work in a linear motion, which is absolutely 100% false, okay? So now we have yet another uh, paper, scientific paper, that claims uh, error in Michelson and Morley experiment dated February 16th, 2019, and get this, let's jump to the conclusion here. So I'm gonna read this really quick. Rotation symmetry in the Michelson-Morley experiment incidentally allows many physicists to mistakenly believe that the speed of light is invariant in all inertial reference frames. Well, we just covered that. We, we know that's nonsense. The speed of light 
is absolutely variant, right? So, the, but they want you to believe that it's invariant. The speed of light is constant in every direction, but only in the rest frame of the light emitter. Upon reflection by a moving mirror, light will travel at a different speed with a different frequency. The mirror will either accelerate or slow down the light. The speed of light depends on the reference frame. The error in Michelson-Morley experiment resulted in the incorrect speculations of length contraction. Yeah, boy, did it. And the constant speed of light, both of which were adopted by the theory of special relativity. Well, we've already debunked that. The source of both speculations is the Lorentz transformation, which was proposed to explain the calculation error, length contraction. Lorentz transformation claims that two simultaneous events cannot be simultaneous in another inertial reference frame because of time dilation. This is proved to be incorrect by the conservation of elapsed time. If the elapsed time is zero in one inertial reference frame, it is also zero in another inertial reference frame. Two simultaneous events are always simultaneous in another reference frame. Bada bing, there it is. Okay, and I will put this in the show notes. But the bottom line, guys, is, is that... <laughs> The, the, yeah, the, everything is bullshit. Okay, it's all bullshit. It's all yeah. bullshit. And the, the fiber fantasy. optic gyro is well, not well measuring. Yeah, it was not measuring Earth rotation. It's something else that's measuring. And of course, what they're calling ether now is the quantum field. They can't call it ether anymore, or they they're reluctant to, even though there's still a lot of experiments out there calling it ether. Uh, but the mainstream has now kind of rephrased it to something like quantum field. Or you know any other term but ether because that's like saying the n word. You just can't do that. Yeah. Ken Ken Wheeler elaborates on that. Yeah. And of course, like I said, scientists are figuring this out. I can't even tell you guys how many people. Uh, I have a couple that are actually uh, PhDs. Uh, one guy in particular is a PhD candidate. Um, he has his master's. He's a professor of electrical engineering. Um, he's in the community. I can't say his name. He doesn't want to be. Uh, he doesn't want to be recognized or anything like that, but he is one of many, many people that are coming forward saying this whole thing is BS. And in fact, uh, this very same person was one of the guys, this, this PhD uh, candidate for electrical engineering was one of the guys that gave us a suggestion um, in how we can use this fiber optic gyro to provide conclusive proof of ether rotation and not earth rotation. And it's a brilliant suggestion. And that's exactly why the fiber optic gyro is now sitting here in my office here in Colorado, because we're going to be doing some really killer experiments um, up at 14,000 foot peaks and then down at the uh, lowest points of Colorado at around uh, 3,500 feet or something like that. Colorado is the perfect place to do these tests. So that's, you know, kind of what all this led up to. Um, is that we are getting so much proof now that is saying that uh, the, the Sandiac effect uh, and Michelson-Morley is absolutely, they're both legitimate. They both work exactly the same way. You cannot accept one and discount the other. When one is showing rotation, and we have acknowledged that from day one, but nobody wants to acknowledge the failed Michelson-Morley results that do not detect any forward velocity around the sun or any other velocity for that matter. So it's done, stick a fork in it, and we're just going to keep beating the hell out of this until people finally get it through their head. But the proof is pouring in and it's overwhelming. The third paper I would like to point out is Generalized Sagnac Effect. Link will be in the video description. From the paper, I quote, It is believed that the Sagnac effect exists only in circular motion. However, we have discovered that any moving path contributes to the total phase difference between two counterpropagating light beams in the loop. I would like to point out a diagram in the paper. We see one straight rectilinear portion of the fiber optic loop being moved in an experiment. All other motion of the fiber optic loop was designed to cancel out. Figure 3A shows a fiber optic parallelogram. 
While moving, the two side arms, being flexible, are kept the same shape so that the phase differences in these two side arms cancel each other. There is no phase difference in the bottom stationary arm. Therefore, the detected phase difference is contributed solely by the motion of the top arm. Again, we hear from Bob Nodell of Globebusters. For all of you that, you know, either made accusations or were wondering or whatever, you know, uh, about the output of the fiber optic gyro, Rick, Seventh Day True Seeker, has released as of yesterday uh, an hour and 44 minute video. And he is going to be redoing this, um, I believe he said, with uh, uh, digital timing on it. But um, it's showing the fiber optic gyro and its outputs. Okay. And he's going to uh, keep putting these out. You know, he's going to put these out. He's going to have uh, a little bit better uh, timing on it. He's going to put a digital clock next to it and all that. But the, the bottom line is, is for those of you accusing us of not putting out this information or whatever, you know, we've maintained since day one, this fiber optic gyro belongs to Rick, Seventh Day True Seeker. Um, and he has now put out the video that, that's showing and this is this is pretty much it it shows the pitch yaw and roll and he also uh, shows he talks a little bit more about it down here and gives some more spe specifications um, you know where he's at and where uh, what the output of the gyro is etc um, so everything that you need to know to extrapolate whatever you want to conclude from it is here on his uh, channel so um, have at it guys but you know, it is still our contention, even though the mainstream media or the mainstream science community. And, and I have to say, by the way, it is not the majority of the mainstream science community at all that is uh, saying that there is no such thing as ether. I mean, the ether, it exists, guys, and, and they do experiments on it all the time. Science is fully aware of it. Um, they simply try to dismiss it by entering in these relativistic um, uh, type equations, which essentially uh, make make everything, well, relative, right? And that's their way of trying to dismiss it. But it's utter nonsense. And, you know, we're going to be talking about this more and more and more. And the reason that, you know, we have claimed uh, that it is the ether that the fiber optic gyro is actually detecting um, Again, it goes back to the Mickelson-Gale experiment, which, of course, determined this in the first place, that there is something rotating uh, at 15 degrees per hour uh, on Earth. Now, we can observably look up and see the stars and know that they're doing that. We can observably look up and, and see the sun and know that that's doing that. And you can either conclude that it is the Earth that is turning underneath the stars or the stars and the sun that's turning above us. That, of course, has been a debate for a long, long time. Um, but, you know, there have been other experiments that have proven, you know, exactly which one is moving. And Aries failure is one of those things. But, you know, as I have maintained, the the interferometers are working based on something that is called the Sanyak effect. And that is basically getting back a phase differential um, from two from the same light beam going around the the same path or being compared um, with a, another path and it gives you an interference pattern when one of those paths is changed. Now the Mickelson Morley experiment in and of itself is also an interferometer based experiment that is using phase shifts or interference patterns to determine motion. The problem guys is this Mickelson Morley was not able to detect any forward motion of the earth around the sun it is based precisely on exactly the same type of technology the same idea the same theory everything as the Mickelson Gale uh, or the Sanyak experiments okay it's interferometry and you cannot, you cannot say you're detecting a circular motion and then turn right around and deny the fact that no forward motion has ever been detected. Now that is something for that it's very complex to, to try and wrap your head around this, but that's it in a nutshell. 
Um, and that's something that, that we are going to be elaborating on greatly. And like I said, this is not a subject for the faint at heart because it does get uh, a bit on the complex side. And there is a lot of material out there on it. And uh, of course, FE Core, uh, we already, in fact, this week, <laughs> um, we have a new uh, engineer that just, just joined FE Core, and his specialty is metrology, meaning uh, he... He measures things. He's an engineer that measures things. He does uh, precision measurement on test equipment, on on apparatuses, machined things like that. And one of the pieces of equipment in his lab, and I was there this week, is a Michelson-based interferometer. And this interferometer has a sensitivity of 10 to the negative sixth, or um, uh, basically... Uh, you know, six six decimal places. It, it, it's a it's a fairly high sensitivity. It's nowhere near the sensitivity that the ring laser gyros do, which have you know probably closer to ten to the negative ninth or ten to the negative twelfth sensitivity. But to give you an idea of of what we're dealing with here and how sensitive this is, um, as um, he and I were you know using this piece of equipment, he had it mounted to a granite slab, which I believe was about four inches thick, right? Now, one would think that something mounted on a granite slab that was bounded, that was bolted on a metal table that was bolted to a concrete floor would not be moving at all. And yet we were sitting there watching it and it was showing that the distance in the beams was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, you know, at this 10 to the negative six level. Well, what could that be? Well, it turns out that what was going on was the, it was on a Friday evening and everybody had left. So they turned the heat down and the, the room temperature was dropping ever so slightly. And as it was doing that, the granite was actually shrinking and the interferometer was picking it up. So this is the kind of precision that we're talking about that these interferometers are capable of. And that's only at 10 to the negative sixth. When you're talking about, you know, what the ring laser gyros and the fiber optic gyros can do to 10 to the negative ninth or even uh, 10 to the negative twelfth, um, we're talking about some serious precision that's going on here. Okay, so that's what I'm saying is that based on this very same type of technology, um, Michelson Morley was not able to measure uh, any forward velocity of the Earth around the Sun. And all, the only motion that interferometry picks up is a 15 degree per hour rotation, as I stated in the movie. Okay, guys? So there's a lot of schools of thought on this, but the, the idea of the ether not existing is all but it, it does exist, all right? And, and the majority, I would say, of the people, of the scientists out there would agree with this. And the fact is, the bottom line is this. Without the ether, the Sanyak effect could not exist, period, okay? You can try and explain it away with the Lorentz contraction, um, you know, uh, uh, equations. But the reality is, is that, you know, we have real life devices that are actually working in this. What would you think of a university, or indeed the whole university system around the world, that deliberately never mentions to their science students three important experiments, simply because they completely contradict the present accepted orthodox views of our planetary system and astronomy in general? This is what has actually happened. The second is a scenario that I would like you to think about. Imagine that you are in a small boat in the middle of a very large circular lake. Not far away is a very large liner, and it seems to be going around you regularly. You know how far away it is, and from the time it passes a light on the shore of the lake, you can work out that it is travelling at, say, 30 miles an hour. But it dawns on you that it might be you travelling round the liner and you cannot tell whether it is you circling the liner or the liner circling you. But there is an easy way to determine which of these two possibilities is correct. All you have to do is to put your hand in the water. 
If you seem to be moving at about 30 mile an hour, then it is you circling round the liner. But if you are almost stationary, then it is the liner travelling around you at 30 mile an hour. Now that is a scenario that I would like you to bear in mind in this video. All orthodox models of the planetary system have all the planets circling the Sun in an anti-clockwise direction as seen from our North Pole. And in addition, the Earth is spinning on its axis also in an anti-clockwise direction. On its orbit around the Sun, the Earth travels at 30 kilometers per second through the ether. In 1887, Michelson and Morley carried out an experiment to check this speed of the Earth through the ether. They passed light through two long arms, one in the direction of the Earth's travel and the other at right angles to it. The light travelling in the direction of the Earth's travel should have taken longer to return than that travelling at right angles to the Earth's direction of travel. To the amazement of the scientific world, no such speed as 30 kilometers per second was detected. But they did get speeds between 1 and 10 kilometers per second. Ignoring these speeds, this experiment is always referred to as giving a null result. This shook the scientific world, and to overcome the implication that the Earth was stationary, they invented the Fitzgerald Lorenz contraction. This claimed that the arm that was in the direction of the Earth's travel became shorter, so that the time to return was the same as in the other arm. There was absolutely no justification for such a solution. It was only invented to overcome the idea that the Earth was stationary in the ether. As Arthur Miller stated, this invention of the Fitzgerald Lorentz contraction was a physics of desperation. So troubling was this to scientists that eventually Einstein produced his relativity theory by which he overcame the problem by simply abolishing the ether. He first said that he did not know of the Michelson Morley experiment, but later admitted that he produced his theory to overcome the Michelson Morley result. But abolishing the ether caused many problems with Einstein's relativity theory, which I have exposed in a separate video dealing with this fraudulent theory that is maintained by propaganda. Einstein's biographer commented, the problem that now faced science after the Michelson Morley null result was considerable, for there seemed to be only three alternatives. The first was that the Earth was standing still, which meant scuttling the whole Copernican theory and was unthinkable. The second was that the ether was carried along by the Earth in its passage through space a possibility which had already been ruled out to the satisfaction of the scientific community by a number of experiments, notably those of the English astronomer James Bradley. The third solution was that the ether simply did not exist, which to many 19th century scientists was equivalent to scrapping current views of light, electricity and magnetism and starting again. Notice that the last two possibilities are quite different from the first one. The first possibility is rejected not because there was any scientific result that contradicted it. Indeed, it is the only one that fits all the results of the experiments carried out. The other two run into huge experimental problems requiring much mathematical juggling and slate of hand tricks to come to their defence. The first is rejected because of the purely philosophical horror of having to accept the possibility that the Earth truly is stationary and at the centre of the rotating ether. The Earth really is at the centre of the universe. 
It is the geocentric model that actually has by far the best support from the scientific results we have been examining and the simplest explanation of them. The Michelson-Morley experiment is the only one of four experiments that is well known. The other three experiments never taught are 1. The Michelson-Gale experiment that showed that the ether was passing across the surface of the Earth once every 24 hours. 2. Aries failure experiment proved that it was the moving starlight carried by the rotating ether that was passing across the stationary Earth. 3. The Sanyak experiment that proved there was an ether, thus demolishing relativity theory. I have made separate videos giving more detailed explanations of the last two. Let us examine briefly these three experiments. The Michelson-Gale experiment used sealed tubes covering a large area that measured the speed of the ether relative to the surface of the Earth. They obtained a value that was within 2% of the known speed of about 0.45 kilometers per second at the equator. But this speed could have been due either to the Earth spinning in a stationary ether or the passing of the rotating ether around a stationary Earth. It was Aries failure experiment that proved it was the moving ether passing across a stationary Earth. If the Earth was stationary and the stars were stationary, the starlight would come straight into the telescope. However, if the telescope is moving at, say, 5 mile an hour, you would then have to tip the telescope, let us say, 5 degrees to see the star. However, if the starlight is being carried across the surface of a stationary telescope at 5 mile an hour, you would still have to tip the telescope at 5 degrees to see it. So you cannot tell which one is stationary. To see whether it is the telescope or the stars that are moving, all you have to do is to fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the light when it is in the telescope. If it is the telescope that is moving, then you have to tip the telescope a little further because of the slower speed of the light in the telescope. However, if it is the stars that are moving past the stationary telescope, then the telescope does not have to be tipped any further because the starlight is coming in at the correct angle anyway. That Airy failed to find any further tipping was needed proved that it was the telescope and therefore the Earth that was stationary. This important conclusion was not even mentioned in his report. It was too explosive. Sanyak split a beam of light and sent the two beams in opposite directions around a path, recombined the beams and noted their interference fringes. The whole system was on a turntable and he then turned it at two revolutions per second, remeasured the fringes and found that they had changed. This was due to the movement of the mirrors made the path for one beam longer and the other shorter. This proved that the ether existed because once the light left the source, its speed was controlled by the comparatively stationary ether in the laboratory. This demolished Einstein's relativity theory, which had abolished the ether. So, from these four experiments, it is obvious that the Earth is at the centre of the universe, and the Sun planets, moons and stars are all being swept around the stationary Earth. This is the only explanation that satisfies the most obvious results of all these four experiments. No wonder the universities distort the Michelson-Morley experiment and do not teach the other three hidden experiments. In addition, I have received comments from two scientists complaining that they were never taught about the Sanyak experiment. The first said, After 35 years as a professional physicist, 
With a thesis in relativity, I only learned of the Sanyak experiment last year. Another correspondent complained that his professors never mentioned these important experiments. Dear Mr. Bowden, thank you for your enjoyable and well-written website. I've enjoyed visiting there today. I was especially interested in your comments on geocentricity, which, as noted, are controversial. The amazing thing is that none of the experiments cited were ever discussed in my undergraduate education, nor the implications cited. Yet again, we have the suppression of scientific evidence that supports creation and geocentricity. So much for the academic claim of its pursuit of truth. They should hang their heads in shame. An Explanation of the Michelson-Gale Experiment by Malcolm Bowden In 1925, Michelson and Gale set up an experiment to see if they could detect the rotation of the Earth on its regular one revolution per day. They set up a very large rectangle of 12-inch diameter tubes in a field with a light source and mirrors at the corners. The light travelled in opposite directions around the rectangle and when recombined gave fringe movements which were only 2.6% different from what they expected would be the result of one revolution per day. The very much shorter calibration tube circuit was too small to register any speed difference between the north and south arms. These fringes were used as a basis for the fringe changes when the light went round the full circuit. How did it work? In this diagram I have exaggerated the size of the rectangle of the Michelson Gale tubes to make it clear how it worked. The equator travels approximately 25,000 miles in one day's rotation. You can see that this speed decreases as the latitude increases. At 15 degrees of latitude, the circumference of that latitude is slightly smaller, so it only travels 24,150 miles in each day. The distance travelled per day reduces as the latitude increases, until it is zero at the North Pole. Imagine their tube south arm being at the equator and the north arm on the 30 degrees latitude. The light going round the tubes in both directions would experience a higher velocity of the ether going through the south tube at the equator than when travelling through the northern tube at the 30 degree latitude. When they were recombined, they would produce a different fringe interference pattern when compared with the very much shorter path using the calibration circuit. Although their rectangle was far smaller than this, it was sufficiently large to detect the difference with surprising accuracy. From 269 observations, they obtained an average change of 0.230 fringe. This was only 2.6% different to the calculated change expected of 0.236 fringe. Thus, within experimental accuracy, the ether was passing across the face of the Earth at the predicted one revolution per day. In their report, there is no mention of any conclusions they draw. They simply state the result. Here, surely we can conclude that there is an ether, and either, one, the Earth is rotating one revolution per day, or, two, the ether is rotating around us one revolution per day. That it was item two that was correct had already been demonstrated by Airy in 1871. As we have shown in a separate YouTube video given here below, his results showed that it was the ether 
rotating around the stationary Earth. This was a disastrous result for the establishment scientists, who could not possibly allow any evidence that the Earth was in a special position in the universe to have any scientific support whatsoever. So Airy had to completely fudge his report to say his results merely refuted a proposal by Professor Klingerfuss. So here we now have the MG experiment proving that there was an ether and that it was moving across the surface of the Earth one rotation per day. How does the present-day establishment scientists deal with the awkward results of the Michelson-Gale experiment? They adopt their usual tactics of lying and obfuscation. I use the phrase relativity gobbledygook. The first thing they do is that whatever the obvious interpretation of the results might be, they immediately boldly claim that they confirm relativity theory. They then proceed to muddy the waters by speaking about inertial frames of reference and entering into complex explanations of how the experiment fully confirms relativity. As an example, I give here the entry in Wikipedia for this experiment, and their confusion is obvious. It is a classic example of pure obfuscation and trying to bypass the most obvious conclusion of the results. Just listen to the weasel words they have to use. It should be noted that Michelson remained a believer in the existence of the ether to the end of his life. A quote from Wikipedia on the Michelson-Gale experiment. As it was already pointed out by Michelson in 1904, a positive result in such experiments contradicts the hypothesis of complete ether drag. On the other hand, the stationary ether concept is in agreement with this result, yet it contradicts, with the exception of Lorentz's ether, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Thus, Special relativity is the only theory which explains both experiments. Emphasis MB. Does it really? Here is the bold claim. They do not bother to provide any explanation or evidence whatsoever. The experiment is consistent with relativity for the same reason as all other Sagnac type experiments. See Sagnac effect. That is, rotation is absolute in special relativity because there is no inertial frame of reference in which the whole device is at rest during the complete process of rotation. Emphasis MB. This is pure relativity gobbledygook used to wriggle out of clear evidence. Thus, the light paths of the two rays are different in all of those frames. Consequently, a positive result must occur. It is also possible to define rotating frames in special relativity by the Born coordinates. Yet in those frames, the speed of light is not constant in extended areas anymore. Thus, also, in this view, a positive result must occur. Today, Sagnac type effects due to Earth's rotation are routinely incorporated into GPS. That's the end of the Wikipedia quote. This is another half lie. They have claimed that Sagnac is explained by relativity and that GPS corrections are the results of relativity. These GPS corrections are really classic corrections, including Sagnac, and are nothing to do with relativity. This claim is regularly made by relativists. There are a number of sites on the internet debunking the many false claims of relativity. One of the best dealing with GPS satellites and many other problems with the theory that contends they are not affected by relativity can be seen at the following link. Finally, to get rid of the Michelson-Morley failure to detect the 30 kilometers per second speed of the Earth around the Sun, 
Einstein just abolished the ether in his relativity theory. Yet here we have again clear evidence of the existence of the ether. There is no mention of this awkward fact in this review. Orthodox relativity scientists are all guilty of willful blindness. Malcolm Bowden, 5th of April, 2017
and it is interesting that in his report Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc and that it was still slowly diminishing. This indicates that the speed of light was still decreasing in measurable amounts when Airy performed his experiment in 1871. The result of Airy's experiment, known as Airy's failure, was that the telescope does not have to be tipped further. This proved that it was the incoming light that was moving past a stationary telescope fixed to the stationary Earth. What is interesting in his very brief report of only four pages is that not once did he refer to the astonishing results that the experiment proved that the Earth was stationary. This experiment was also dismissed by Wikipedia which said Ether drag test under the main article Luminiferous Ether. By means of a water-filled telescope Airy in 1871 looked for a change in stellar aberration through the refracting water due to an ether drag. Like in all other ether drift experiments, he obtained a negative result. This is a gross distortion of the truth. That he did not have to change the angle proved that it was the ether drifting past the stationary surface of the Earth. This experiment is never taught to university science students. They might begin to question what they were being taught about the cosmos, the universe, the Big Bang, evolution and much else if it was realised that the Earth really is at the centre of the universe which is rotating around us as the Bible always clearly states. In 1913, Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the whole table at two revolutions per second and found that the fringes changed. This result has very significant implications in science. It works as follows. A beam of light leaves the light source at the bottom left hand corner and is split into two different beams which we have coloured red and blue just to distinguish them. They travel round the circuit in opposite directions until they eventually reach the splitter which also recombines them. There they then go on to the photographic plate where they have interference fringes. In this simplified version we see the beam is split into two, the red and the blue again, and they go round the circuit and are recombined at the splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So to overcome this problem, Einstein 
simply abolished the ether in his relativity theory. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. Let us see how it did this. It is a fundamental feature of relativity that it claims that as there is no ether, light travels away from a source at the same speed relative to the source, whether the source is moving or not. Thus, whether the table is turning or not, the fringe patterns should stay the same. But if the ether exists, once the light has left the source, the speed of the light is controlled by the ether, independent of the speed of the table, mirrors, etc., as we see here. So let us see what happens when we rotate the table. Here, the light is split, and the red and blue lights go in opposite directions. But notice that the left-hand mirror has moved around in such a direction that the distance the red light has to travel is further. Now in relativity, the same time should be taken because the splitter is also moving and the distance between them is the same. But, now imagine that the ether exists and the speed of the light is controlled by the stationary ether. Imagine the ether like a thick treacle that limits how fast the light can travel independent of the motion of the light source, the splitter or the mirrors. The result is that the red light takes longer to reach the left-hand mirror. Similarly, the right-hand mirror is coming towards the blue light, so it reaches the mirror quicker. After they change ends, the red light again takes longer to reach the recombiner, whilst the blue light gets there quicker again. So they reach the photographic plate with a delay between them, and this changes the fringe pattern. In fact, Sanyak, using the speed of the rotation of the table, calculated how much the fringes should change, and found that they did change by just that amount. The crucial feature of this experiment is that it demonstrates that the ether does exist, which demolishes relativity. How does a scientific establishment deal with this result? By muddying the waters with scientific gobbledygook. Wikipedia says, In the above discussion, the rotation mentioned is a rotation with respect to an inertial reference frame. Since this experiment does not involve a relativistic velocity, the same wording is valid both in the context of classical electrodynamics and special relativity. How on earth can it be valid in both theories? It clearly proves that the ether exists because the speed of the light is controlled by the ether independent of the rotating table and mirrors. This Sanyak effect is used by airlines for their compass directions. As the plane turns, the change in the fringes are translated into a change in the direction of the plane that then registers on the cockpit compass. In addition, I have received comments from two scientists complaining that they were never taught about the Sanyak experiment. The first said, after 35 years as a professional physicist with a thesis in relativity, I only learned of Sanyak's experiment last year. Another correspondent complained that his professors never mentioned these important experiments. Dear Mr. Bowden, thank you for your enjoyable and well-written website. I've enjoyed visiting there today. I was especially interested in your comments on geocentricity, which, as noted, are controversial. The amazing thing is that none of the experiments cited were ever discussed in my undergraduate education, nor the implications cited. 
all my life I have heard the story of how Copernicus's theory came to prevail. I would have thought that major experimental evidence already in existence and calling the theory into question would have at least been cited. One feels cheated as a student, of course, to keep finding 25 years later these bodies of contrarian evidence that never are mentioned in the classroom unless a student has already researched the topics and brings them up. Yet again, we have the suppression of scientific evidence that supports creation and geocentricity.